Colonel Wicker. Chairman Dunford, uh, do you support providing lethal defensive aid to Ukraine? I do, Senator, and have made that recommendation. Um, as I understand it, um, DOD um, has officially made an affirmative recommendation and State Department also. So where is that decision and, um, and, and can you um, enlighten the committee? Senator, my understanding is uh, that decision is at the White House. And do you have any idea when we might be able to get an answer on that? Uh, I, I don't, Senator. I, I, I will ask when we get back today. We've been asking for the last couple of weeks, but I, I'm not sure. Well, I think it's very important that the Ukrainian government succeed uh, in, in resisting uh, further Russian expansion. Uh, what, uh, why did you recommend yes on providing lethal aid? Uh, in my judgment, from a military perspective, uh, the Ukraine needed additional capabilities to protect their sovereignty. Uh, as you probably know, Senator, in, in 2016, we trained a number of their battalions. 2017, trained additional battalions. We provided medical uh, supplies, night vision goggles, uh, counter-mortar radars, and other things. But we felt like uh, their ability uh, to stop armored vehicles and so forth would be, would be essential to them to protect themselves. And so... Uh, we just looked at it as a military gap that existed, that if that gap was filled, it would increase the probability the Ukrainians could defend themselves. And I agree. I, I would just encourage um, members of the administration to, uh, to move forward on that. Uh, with regard to Russia's asymmetric threats, such as information operations, cyber attacks, and jamming, I want to ask you specifically about the 173rd Airborne Brigade um, which is uh, said in a report to be under-equipped, undermanned, and inadequately organized. Uh, according to an Army review, three years after Crimea, um, why, is, um, why is this the case? Is it the case? And uh, what can we do about it? Senator, I, I, I read the, uh, the media article and asked a couple of questions <laughs> after I saw it. I think what the leader was doing was describing, uh, you know, the current character of war and indicating that he believed that we ought to make some organizational changes and some equipment changes to make the 173rd base in Vicenza, Italy, more competitive. I think you could make that statement more broadly. So this was a, a leader looking at uh, his particular unit. I think you can look at that, uh, that statement more broadly and say that we need to adapt uh, the U.S. military, really the entire U.S. government, to be able to compete at that level below war where the Russians have so successfully integrated information operations, cyber, political uh, influence, economic coercion, and information operations. So really I think what the 173rd was describing is a force that is designed for conventional war and uh, in needing to make some organizational changes and, and add different capabilities to be competitive in the space that we're describing now. So, uh, writ large, actually, uh, this fairly accurate statement about the 173rd actually could be said about the entire Department of Defense. Is that what you're telling this committee? Well, Senator, I, I think I, I would broaden it. What I, what I would say is today, um, Russians, Chinese, and others are, are on a day-to-day -day basis doing what I describe as they are conducting adversarial competition at a level that falls below conflict. And they have integrated the entire government to be able to do that. And in my judgment, we need to improve our ability to compete in that space. And in the areas specifically I would mention from military capability would be our electronic warfare capability, our cyber capabilities, and our information operations capability. But those, those all have to be integrated with those things that we don't have inside the Department of Defense, of course, the economic and political tools. But in my judgment, bringing all those together on a day-to-day -day basis more effectively is something that we do need to do. And finally, General, with regard to the uh, 355 ship requirement, uh, this is a requirement that's been developed by the generals and admirals in consult consultation with our leadership uh, around the world. Uh, this committee, in the form of the NDAA, has put the Ships Act um, in, in the Senate passed version. It makes the 355 ship requirement the policy of the United States Congress. Uh, the House of Representatives has has also done that, and I expect this will be coming out of conference very soon. Uh, this requirement is, in fact, a serious requirement. 
is it not? And can you assure us that, that from the level of the administration, we're serious about getting to that number and, getting, and, and fulfilling that requirement rather than the 276 ships we have and doing it as quick as practicable? Senator, I, I don't think there's any question that all of us know that the Navy is uh, is smaller right now than it needs to be to meet all of those requirements, and that requirement that you've identified uh, is one that's based on analytic rigor, and it should be a target that we shoot for. Uh, it'd be good to get there as soon as we can, and of course, many of the conversations we're having about the budget will inform our ability to do that, but, but we certainly appreciate your leadership in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman McCain. Uh, welcome, General Dunford. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, Senator King's line of questioning with regard to North Korea. Uh, as you're aware, all six of North Korea's previous nuclear tests have occurred underground. Uh, that obviously contains the radioactive fallout. But Kim Jong-un has since threatened to conduct a test in the Earth's atmosphere. Can you talk a little bit about what the global risks and implications of a nuclear weapon detonated in the atmosphere would be, uh, as Kim Jong-un is reportedly considering? And if you were speaking to the North Korean people right now, what would you say to them regarding the risks uh, of detonating a nuclear weapon in the Earth's atmosphere? No, Senator, I, I think the best experience we have recently, of course, would be the nuclear reactor in Russia some years ago and, and the incident that took place in Japan. And even with something that isn't anywhere near uh, what the North Koreans are suggesting, we had significant health challenges uh, for many, many years and, uh, and, and obviously the loss of, uh, loss of life. It would be an incredibly provocative thing for them to conduct a nuclear test in the Pacific as they, as they have suggested. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think the North Korean people would have to realize how serious that would be, not only for the United States, but for the international community. Uh, I want to just take a quick moment to thank both you and uh, Secretary Mattis for the sober and serious manner that you're approaching North Korea. Uh, I think uh, that is the sort of temperament we need now more than ever. I want to shift gears real quickly. Um, our Commander of Special Operations, General Thomas, has said that the use of weaponized, commercially available drones by our adversaries was SOCOM's, quote, most daunting problem, end quote, in 2016. Uh, how serious is the threat? And uh, can you explain why it's so difficult to deal with this threat with conventional weapons and, and kinetic means? Uh, first, Senator, I, I agree with uh, General Thomas's assessment, and that's the consistent feedback we had uh, we have from our operational commanders. And in fact, uh, about three months ago, four months ago, we sent a team over, led by my J-8, uh, Lieutenant General Tony Ayrdi, to sit down with the commanders to make sure we had a full appreciation of what they were dealing with so we can come back here and immediately f send to them every single capability we possibly could. And we've made some progress in that regard in their ability to deal with this particular threat. But it's also going to require continued experimentation and, uh, and adap adaptation to make sure that we uh, stay out in front of the technology that the enemy has delivered. So this, uh, we have seen them deliver chemical weapons. We've seen them deliver bombs. We've seen them be able to uh, provide increased intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance against our partners on the ground largely. And so it does create a significant challenge. And, uh, and we have done all we can do today to deal with that challenge as well as develop the capabilities we'll need tomorrow. But I, I can assure you, personally that that has been exactly where General Thomas has suggested it should be at the top of our list for current emerging threats in the current fight. Well, I have to say I've been pleased to see the Pentagon respond so quickly with investments in, in laser technologies and other systems to address urgent needs like this one. Uh, will you continue to support the Pentagon's use of rapid acquisition authorities provided by this committee to field new technologies like laser and high power microwaves to help uh, counter those drones and, and swarms? I will, Senator. I, I think that, that having that capability has been one of the bright spots in, in what has been a largely criticized acquisition process. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and I, I think that uh, directed energy on both of those fronts is a, a potential game changer for what's a, a rapidly developing uh, situation with drones in particular. Um, I want to return real quickly to uh, an issue that Senator Kane yes. brought up earlier uh, with regard to Puerto Rico. 
And uh, you mentioned throughput, and one of the things that I understand is a bottleneck with throughput right now in that emergency response is the number of radars that are down and the fact that planes are landing, C-130s, et cetera, on VFR if there's not radar at various airfields. Uh, does DOD have a role in restoring the radar at those airfields? Is that DHS? Um, and what can you tell us about the, hopefully, the, the easing of that bottleneck, which really limits how much we can get in there on a, on a reasonable time period? Uh, Senator, we, we do have uh, the capability and, uh, and, and are right now, again, that's our priority, is focused on making sure the airfields can operate. A piece of their ability to operate will be uh, those expeditionary radars that we have and, and we could provide uh, as required on a short-term on a short -term basis. The, the responsibility is primarily DHS, but at this point, uh, we're not we're not trapped in uh, you know bureaucratic niceties. What we're trying to do is make sure that we get the people of Puerto Rico the support they need when they need it. And the key thing that needs to be done right now, uh, as you're suggesting, is uh, all of the other support they need uh, can't come in until we get the ports and airfields open. Exactly and so right. that's why Northern Command has placed that at the top of the list of uh, support we're providing. Thanks. Thank you very much, General Dunford. On behalf of the Chairman McCain, Senator Purdue, please. General Dunford, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your, you and your family for your service. Uh, I want to remind the committee that the first ship was, I believe, the USS Mercy in Port-au-Prince after the earthquake. And uh, I want to thank the military on record here for always being the first in crisis like this in Puerto Rico. I want to highlight again a, a, a quote that was already referred to uh, by the chairman this morning, because I think in February you called out this crisis. We have a a global security crisis, but we have a debt crisis. And the two right now are, and you're the first one, I believe, to call this out. Your quote was, without sustained, sufficient, and predictable funding, I assess that within five years, we will lose our ability to project power, the basis of how we defend the homeland, advance U.S. interest, and meet our alliance commitments. Wow. Sir, you've, that's a few months forward. Do you still stand by that assessment? Uh, Senator, I do. And, and, you know, if I could just make a quick comment. I know many times the perception is that military leaders will never be satisfied with good enough and they'll always want more. And so uh, somehow maybe people aren't looking at those comments with the seriousness that I intended them to be. I would not have made those comments without having gone on a long journey of analytic rigor to really truly be able to quantify exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. I think we've shared with you, Senator, because of your interest, we've shared with you some of the results uh, of our work. But those words are backed by a fairly exhaustive analytic effort that shows specific capability areas where we are in the process of losing our competitive advantage. And in the aggregate, when you go out four or five years, the loss of our competitive advantage in those specific areas means we will not be able to project power when and where necessary to advance our interests. That does two things. It not only affects our response to crisis, but it increases the probability there will be a crisis because it will have an adverse effect on a deterrent capability of the U.S. military. I believe that one of the things that deters others today from a conventional conflict is their knowledge that we do have a competitive conventional advantage over any adversary today, and we can project power when and where necessary to advance our interests. Were we to lose that, I, I believe that there would be an increased uh, possibility of conflict, particularly against our peer competitors. Well, that's the question I have today for you, sir, is, you know, if you look at the latest estimate, uh, back in 2011, um, then-Chairman uh, Gates, Secretary of, Defense, or Secretary of Defense then, made the estimate based on a bottoms-up estimate from the military on, on needs, and that estimate was uh, in today's dollars for 2016 about $753 billion. Last year we actually appropriated 623 only. That's all of category 050, I believe. This year it's going to be a little bit greater than that, 677 or, or thereabouts, but we're still significantly less than just what Secretary Gates wanted back then for 2016. That was before ISIS, Crimea, Ukraine, Syria, Iran, North Korea, and, and on and on and on. Uh, with Russia and China's new, uh, growing capabilities. Sir, my question, and oh, by the way, you mentioned 3 to 7 percent. I don't disagree with that. I don't know what the need is, but I know that we are at a low point right now historically. I can look at the, the history. We've, we've averaged over the last 30 years after Vietnam 4 percent. We're now at 3 percent. That 100 basis points is $200 billion. So any way you look at it today, my estimate is somewhere between 150 and 200 that we're short today, even with being 89 
uh, billion dollars above the BCA. Sir, my question is, how do you determine the priorities going forward with that kind of shortfall? Because we, every dime that we're spending on the military today and on our veterans and on all domestic discretionary spending, and let me say this again, every dime that we spend on our military and our veterans today, by definition, is borrowed money. In the last eight years, and it's projected the next 10 years will be similar, we borrowed 35% of what we spend as a federal government. 25% of that spending is discretionary and military is part of that. Sir, given all of that, you and Secretary Mattis have talked about the first step in the strategy is filling the hole. Are we on board doing that now with the, with the appropriation this year? And what does the next two or three years look like in terms of trying to catch up with um, a number of, of years, not just the last six or eight, a number of years, 20 years even, of disinvesting in the military. No, thanks, Senator. The, the way that we have characterized it in our recommendations is that we have readiness challenges. That's been described as the, as the filling the holes. We have lethality challenges, and, and by that we mean areas like electronic warfare, cyber capability, our strike capability uh, that, that needs to be improved. And then there's a capacity issue. And ideally, we'd be addressing all of those. We'd be addressing the current readiness of the force that we have. We'd be improving the capabilities we need for tomorrow, and we'd be increasing the capacity of the force to meet the overall requirements that we have. So the way we've chosen to prioritize it is to make sure that we, number one, make sure that the men and women today in those units that we're deploying have the wherewithal to accomplish the mission with minimal loss of life or equipment. That's, that's, that's job one. The second thing we're doing, and you saw this in the last two years, is starting to make increased investments, number one, in our nuclear enterprise because deterring nuclear war is job one for the department, and then addressing some of these deficiencies in cyber capabilities, electronic warfare, ballistic missile defense, which we've spoken about. What we have not done is come in with uh, a recommendation to increase the size or the capacity of the force because, in my judgment, we should not do that unless we can do it in a balanced way. And there's no way with the current level of resourcing we have and the projected level of resourcing that we can grow the force in a balanced way. So I think we're forced to fill the holes, address the readiness, and then do what we can to invest in the capabilities that we need to maintain competitiveness today and tomorrow. But I don't see in the near term our ability to really grow the force to get after the dynamic that has been discussed a bit this morning where we have fewer ships than are necessary even to do ballistic missile defense on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in the Pacific. And that's the challenge that we have, and that's kind of the three ways we think about it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Warren, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Dunford, good to see you here. So I want to ask you about the nuclear deal between the United States, the five partner nations, and Iran that has placed Iran's nuclear program under verifiable limits and unprecedented in inspections so that it cannot develop a nuclear weapon. The Trump administration has already certified twice to Congress that Iran is complying with this agreement. If President Trump does not certify again by October 15th, he risks blowing up this agreement, and Iran may restart again, building a nuclear weapon. Now, when asked about the Iran nuclear deal in January, Secretary Mattis told this committee that it is, quote, an imperfect arms control agreement. But he also said, quote, when America gives her word, we have to live up to it and work with our allies. General, do you agree with that? Uh, Senator, I, I do, and, and my uh, recommendation the previous two times was informed by that and the fact that the intelligence community had determined that there was not a material breach uh, to the JICPOA. And so what, what I recommended is that we focus leveraging our partners that were part of that agreement to deal with those other challenges that, that we know Iran poses, uh, whether it's the te terrorist threat, the maritime threat, and so forth. Well, you know, this is always the issues. Iran supports terrorism, engages in human rights abuses, works to develop ballistic missiles. But I think it's easier to counter Iran's destabilizing behavior if it has no nuclear weapon than it would be to keep Iran in check if it had access to a nuclear bomb. So the question I have is, aside from the current nuclear deal, at this time, are you aware of any alternative binding diplomatic agreement that would prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon? Uh, I, I am not, Senator. I, I would highlight, though, the one thing we all have to come to grips with is there is a sunset yes. uh, to the current JICPOA, and that, that needs to be addressed in the near term. 
It, it certainly does. But for right now, it appears that the Iran deal is working. There is no viable alternative, and it sounds like we need to keep enforcing this deal to keep us all safe. I, I want to ask you another question, and that is about North Korea. You know, m most of the time, the discussion centers on the role of China. But I want to ask about Russia's relationship, which is also critical to influencing the North Korean regime. Russia has completed a railroad linking the two countries. A uh, ferry now operates between Russia and North Korea. Vladimir Putin wrote off 90% of North Korea's $11 billion debt to Russia. State Department estimates that North Korea sends about 20,000 workers to Russia annually, which produces foreign currency that Kim Jong-un desperately needs. And while we're trying to pull the international community together to, to try to persuade North Korea to stand down on nuclear weapons, Reports emerged last week that fuel shipments between Russia and North Korea are increasing. So, General Dunford, I want to ask, beyond our existing sanctions and authorities, what more should we be doing to counter Russia's support for North Korea? Uh, Senator, I, I do believe that the solution to, uh, to what's going on with Russia and China is diplomatic at this point. And, and economic to the degree that, that sanctions and second and third order sanctions uh, can be implemented. Uh, I don't think there is at this point a, a military dimension uh, to the challenge of, of uh, getting better cooperation from Russia and China. But I do believe that the things that Secretary Tillerson has proposed to do and what Secretary Mnuchin has, uh, has implemented over the past couple of months may be affecting the calculus of Russia and China, although I think we're a long way from determining whether or not the path we're on will result in peaceful denuclearization, which, of course, is what we all want to see. But, so let me ask you to put this question, though, in a larger frame. You know, Russia seems to intervene in a lot of places in opposition to the United States, Syria, Afghanistan, North Korea. Can you just say a word about how you see Putin's larger strategy here? I think I think that if you there's very few places that I could look at in the world, Senator, where U.S. and Russian interests align. Uh, and I think in many cases, what they're trying to do, if you start in Europe, uh, their primary focus is to undermine the credibility of the NATO alliance. If you look across the Middle East, they're trying to undermine the partnerships that we have and erode the confidence uh, in our partners of the U.S. commitment to the region. And I think by the same token, they're trying to be, play a spoiler role in, uh, in achieve undue influence in the issue on the Korean Peninsula that you spoke about a minute ago. So I can't think of too many places where Russia is playing a helpful role right now, from the Maghreb to the Middle East uh, to North Korea. Yeah, I, I just think it's so critical as we talk about our alliances around the world that we recognize exactly this point, that Russia is doing everything it can to break up those alliances, to sow discord in those alliances, and the importance of our keeping them together, and the importance of holding Russia accountable for what it's doing with North Korea. Hey, Senator, if I could just make a quick comment on that. Please. I mean, when we, when we developed the national military strategy that we have right now, we determined that the strength of the U.S. military was uh, our allies and partners and a network we built up since World War II. Uh, not only Russia, but others recognize that that's our source of strength. And so there's a concerted effort uh, to undermine those allies and partners. And so what we should be doing at this point is doubling down our efforts to, to maintain strong alliances and partnerships, because that, that is the key to success. Good. Thank you very much, General. On behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General. Congratulations to you, sir, and your family. Um, for your decades of, of exceptional service. I, I look forward to supporting your swift reconfirmation. I wanted to turn to an issue that you and I have talked a lot about uh, in the NDAA. I had a provision in there this year that talked about the, our FONOPS policy and how we should be looking at regular routine and, if possible, with allies. So in some ways, our FONOPS, particularly in the South China Sea, are no longer newsworthy. Can you elaborate uh, a bit on the department's FONOPS policy and if this differs from the previous administration? For example, you know, it was reported that Admiral Harris essentially had to get individual FONOPS approved by the NSC one at a time uh, under the Obama administration. What's, what's the strategy right now under the Trump administration and uh, how does that differ? 
No, Senator, thanks. Um, that is a good question. Senator, uh, Secretary Mattis, when he came in uh, in early February, uh, we went to him with a couple of individual uh, freedom of navigation operations that you spoke about. And, uh, and he said, hey, look, I, I, how about give me a full strategy that lays this thing out now for a long period of time and, and talks about the strategic effect we're trying to achieve. You spoke about uh, partners. You talk about being uh, routine uh, and regular. And so uh, those are the things that Secretary Mattis directed. Uh, after that, uh, Admiral Harris uh, developed a long-term plan for freedom of navigation operations, and that's what we're implementing right now as a strategic approach to freedom of navigation operations that, that does, in fact, support our overall strategy uh, in the Pacific as well as the specific uh, mission, which is to ensure that we fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows, and we continue to validate those claims. Uh, where we see international airspace, for that matter, or uh, the maritime domain. So those are going well, regular, routine, with our allies, if possible, not micromanaged from the NSC? Th that's right. And, uh, and, and Senator, in, in candor, uh, we still and always will take into account what else is happening sure. in the strategic environment, whether it's a UN General Assembly or some other event. But, but, it, but we do have a base plan from which we're operating right now in a healthy dialogue, I believe, between the commander and the secretary of defense. Let me uh, turn to missile defense. You've had a lot of questions today. I think, it, is it safe to say that the administration views a much more robust missile defense as a key part of our strategy with regard to North Korea or Iran? Um, with regard to rogue nations like those two countries that are trying to acquire intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles? No question, Senator. So you mentioned the NDAA does a lot. We do, but I think there's more that we should be doing. Does the administration have plans to, at least from a supplemental perspective or working with the Congress, uh, beefing up our missile defense? I think it's something we all agree it's very bipartisan, by the way, uh, that we need to be doing. What are more specifics, General, you could share with us on what we need to be doing and how can Congress support you? Sure. Senator, we did uh, do exactly as you suggest, and we've submitted it. And if you don't have a copy of that, I'll make sure you get one. But we, we looked at additional radar systems. We looked at THAAD systems, Patriot systems. Uh, as you know, in the NDAA, there's additional interceptors, uh, additional 21, I think, is the number that I recall uh, that are in there. Uh, all of those issues are, are part of it. We did an immediate kind of supplemental, for, just as your suggestion, for ballistic missile defense. I think it was maybe the first or second week of August to make sure it was in time for the budget cycle. So I think what you have outlined in the NDAA combined with the supplemental that the administration has has put together will will meet the immediate needs. Uh, but, of course, we need a long-term uh, strategic approach to ballistic missile defense in buying the same capabilities that we have today uh, into the future is not going to be the solution as the threat adapts. And, and I know you've received some of the classified briefings on the adaptations of the threat, which means our ballistic missile defense capabilities also have to adapt. Well, we, we want to work with you on that. I think it's an area, like I said, of bipartisan cooperation in the Congress, which is new but important development, and we want to work with the administration on that. Let me end just a final question. I really want to applaud you and General Mattis uh, the entire administration, Secretary Tillerson, on the North Korea strategy. I think uh, what you're trying to achieve, your focus on it. Importantly, your frequent and constructive engagement with Congress asking us to play our part have also been very, very uh, an important element of that strategy. I also believe that you talk a lot about credible military options, and that to me is an effective element of our diplomacy effective diplomacy, which I think we're starting to see a lot of progress in that, in that realm. If one of the options was a preemptive or preventive ground war on the Korean Peninsula, like the Gulf War in 1990 or 2003 that was launched by the U.S., my view is that would require an AUMF from the Congress and constitutionally and politically this would help our policy with regard to leverage, with regard to the ability to show the world that the American people were behind that. Do you agree with that? And is that something that the administration has started to talk about? I've raised it with a number of folks. I think it's an important issue. We want to be supportive. I think you're getting bipartisan support for what the strategy is. But that kind of issue to me is something that we need to be prepared to discuss. Do you have a view on that, General? Senator, I think what I'd do is probably narrow my view to uh, the scenario you're describing 
uh, I would want to have the full-throated support of the American people in the form of the Congress uh, if we did something like you're suggesting. Right, and I, and I use that language very um, carefully. I know the president has a lot of authority to react, to take action, particularly if we're attacked, but I'm talking about a ground war a la 1950, um, launched by the United States, although in 1950, as you know, there was no congressional authorization. I think that's an important topic. I think it gives us leverage, and I'm glad to see that you believe that for something like that, you would want that. And I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, it's an important Senator, issue. I think, I think again, uh, we know from history that uh, we are going to be much better, uh, much better degree of success if we have the full-throated support of the American people when we go to war. You, what you're suggesting is going to war. And, Correct. Uh, and if we're going to conduct a major war, then having the full support of the American people in the form of the Congress, I think, is, is something we need to have. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, on behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Nelson. General Mattis, uh, General Dunford, uh, you have uh, certainly uh, my confidence in you. And the reason I said General Mattis, uh, I also have that confidence in General Mattis, and I also have that confidence in General Kelly. Is there something about Marines that inspires confidence? <laughs> Senator, in my, in my current assignment, I don't think you want me to answer that question, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Vladimir Putin cannot beat us on land. He can't beat us on the sea. He can't beat us under the sea. He can't beat us in the air. And he can't beat us in space. But he can beat us in cyber. You want to comment on that, how our forces are organized to deter encounter? Uh, thanks, Senator. I, I mean, I, I would agree with your assessment that the most significant threat in cyberspace we, we face today, the most advanced capabilities uh, are, are the Russians. That's our, that's our assessment. I, I, would, I would argue, though, that it's not only his cyber capability. The one thing that, uh, that the Russians have effectively done is combine that cyber capability with political influence operations, economic coercion, information operations, electronic warfare, and even military posture. And if you take those four or five things and you look at the centralized command and control system that Russia has, uh, even playing an overall weekend, as you've described each of the domains where we have dominance, even with an overall weekend, uh, they've been able to effectively advance their interests uh, without without going to war. And, and, and I do believe that that's an area that not only should we be focused on in the department, and our recent global campaign plans now have added what I call competition, adversarial competition, short of armed conflict, as being an area uh, that is included in our campaign plans. But I also believe we need to take a look at that from a whole of government perspective as well in order to be competitive. Absolutely. Um because you know what he can do in the next election. He doesn't, it, and, and the newspapers have reported that he's already in several states' registration records. All he has to do is particular critical precincts go in and eliminate every 10th voter. You can imagine the chaos that would occur on election day if uh, the voters get there, and I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, you're not registered. <clears throat> uh, that would be <coughs> significantly disruptive to our to our infrastructure and to the underpinnings of our country, a free and fair election. Um, the president's budget makes significant <coughs> funding cuts in the Department of State. <coughs> and USAID. Does that make sense to you? What I, what I can say is, uh, <clears throat> Senator, that there's no challenge that I'm currently dealing with that, that the primary factors in our success won't be 
diplomatic, economic, and and uh, and certainly even in our campaign in Iraq and Syria, USAID plays a critical role in the stabilization uh, to secure the gains that our partners <coughs> are making on the ground in Syria and Iraq as one example. But every place I've been uh, over the past 15 or 16 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, a key partner has been USAID. Well, and as uh, you all, as military commanders, you also project American power in the forms of using so many of our other agencies of government uh, uh, so that you become not only a warrior as a military commander, you become a diplomat as well, utilizing those other levers of power. We've seen that used very effectively by your respective commanders in Africa. Likewise, again, in Latin America. And uh, if you don't have those other agencies, and I just mentioned two, state and USAID, uh, it clearly clips your wings in being able to function as a military commander. Any further comment on that? Senator, I think I'd probably just reinforce the one point that uh, today any of our military commanders to be successful have got to achieve unity of effort with the other government agencies that are on the ground. And you mentioned, too, but if I think of our Afghanistan experience, the FBI was there, the DEA was there, uh, uh, Customs Border Police was there. So uh, I, I agree with the thesis that, uh, that the, the, the challenges that we face today are complex contingencies and they require elements of all of our government in order to be successful. And so trying to draw a distinction between the security of our nation in one department is not possible today. Uh, you know, many departments in our government are all involved in the fundamental task of government, which is, which is security. And General, uh, thank you also to your family for the sacrifices that they have made over the years in allowing him to continue to serve his country and for you all continuing to serve the country in the role that you have, which is substantial. Thank you. On behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Green, please. Uh, thank you, General Dunford, for your service. Uh, why should I vote for you? Senator, uh, over the past two years, uh, I think I, I have provided best military advice. Okay, so you've got me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the next two years, don't you agree that sequestration needs to be fixed or we're going to go backwards? Uh, it does, Senator. Do you agree with me if you don't reform entitlements over the arc of time, there's no money left to do anything other than entitlements? Uh, Senator, I, I've seen the math, and, and, uh, and we're headed towards a situation where it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, so entitlement reform is necessary to keep strong military. Uh, I want to look at the uh, threats going forward. Uh, in the next two years. Do you agree that there must be a credible military option on the table when it comes to North Korea? I do, Senator, and, uh, and I personally conveyed that to, our, uh, to, to China and to our allies in the region. Do you agree with me that uh, Iran has taken the money from the uh, Iranian nuclear agreement and done more damage with it than good? Uh, there are indicators that some money that was freed up as a result of, of JICPOA has been, has been put back into malign activities, and certainly I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to find anything that Iran does that is good. So uh, the goal of the agreement was to get them back into the family of nations. Would you say thus far that has not been achieved? Uh, Iran is not part of the family of nations today, Senator. Yeah. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Syria, do you agree with me that if we leave Assad in power, it's going to be very difficult to end this war. Senator, I have looked at Syria, as you, as you can imagine, pretty hard, and I think addressing the grievances of the civil war are going to be necessary to have a stable political construct. Okay. In terms of Russia, over the last six months, have they gotten better, worse, or about the same? Uh, in Syria, Senator? Anywhere. Uh, Everywhere. I, they certainly haven't gotten any better anywhere. Okay. Uh, there may be evidence that Russia was de more deeply involved in sending out fake news <clears throat> during our last election. Does that trouble you? It, it troubles me, Senator, although I don't have any unique insight into it. Okay. Afghanistan, the recent decision to add more capability with rules of engagement changes. Do you think that is uh, necessary to be continued? I, I think it is necessary, uh, Senator, and, and I think it will help uh, to get the Afghan security forces uh, to reverse 
the trends of the last two years, casualties and the lost ground that they have experienced. I think what this, what this additional effort will allow us to do is provide more effective advisory effort down to the tactical level with the Afghans and also better leverage the air support that we have. And we have increased the air support as well. And there's a new emphasis on Pakistan where they need to be a better part of the team. That's exactly right, Senator. There's there's a key assumption in our uh, in the president's South Asia strategy that Pakistan cannot uh, continue to be a sanctuary for Haqqani, Taliban, and others in in our and we have success. Would you agree with me that we have to have very skilled ambassadors uh, representing our country in both Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India to get a good outcome militarily? I would agree, uh, Senator, and I was very encouraged. I think you were on a committee that we uh, that we confirmed uh, uh, Ambassador Bass to go to Afghanistan. I've got a, a, a good experience with him in Turkey. I've watched him deal with difficult situations, so I think we have the right man headed to Afghanistan. So in Iraq, uh, it's just a matter of time. Do we clear ISIL out of Iraq? Do you agree with that? I believe the Iraqi security forces are on a pretty good trajectory right now to clear out ISIS. Uh, as you look forward in Iraq, if the Iraqis would accept a follow-on force, do you believe it is our national security interest this time to leave some troops behind to continue to work with the Iraqis? I do, Senator. I think there's a large recognition uh, both in Iraq and certainly for the coalition partners that are there that continued training of the Iraqi security forces is going to be necessary for them to become self-sustaining. Uh, obviously, the decision is going to have to be a political decision between the Iraqi government and the U.S. government. But from a military perspective, I certainly uh, believe that that's necessary. And finally, do you agree if the world is seen as capitulating to Kim Jong-un, the United States, but the world at large, that the Iranians will watch and have a different view of where they should be going? Well, I think all of uh, all the nations that, uh, you know, I would consider adversaries or potential adversaries will watch closely what's happening on the Korean Peninsula. And finally, it's the policy of this administration to deny the North Korean regime the ability to develop an ICBM with a nuclear weapon on top to hit the American homeland, not contain it, but deny it. Is that correct? That is, that is the articulated policy of President Trump. Do you it agree is, with that Senator. policy? I do, Senator. Thank you, and I look forward to uh, your service for the next two years. Our men and women in the military could not be in finer hands. Thank you and your Thank family. Thank you, Senator. On behalf of Chairman McCain, let me recognize Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Dunford, first of all, thank you for your service and to your family as well. Uh, I would like to focus just briefly on Puerto Rico. You were asked about it earlier. Is there more that the Department of Defense can do to provide assistance in the midst of this humanitarian crisis, which involves not only human suffering, but also the interruption for some period of time of communications, of travel, logistics, uh, the lifeblood uh, in terms of infrastructure of the island. Is there more that the military can do? Senator, if there is, uh, we'll be doing it. Uh, we're in a constant, first of all, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And we've watched uh, the tragedy unfold here over the last few days. Um, the last update I had, not just to come over here, but just because that's how constant we're getting updated, was an update on our efforts in Puerto Rico. Uh, to date, uh, what they've identified are the things that would allow us to open the airfields, open the ports, and get that immediate electricity, uh, fresh water, and food to the, uh, to, the, to the people in Puerto Rico. But if there is more that, uh, that needs to be done, I, I can assure you that that Secretary Mattis has placed uh, Puerto Rico as a priority for all of us, and, and General Robinson is in constant contact with FEMA as well as officials in Puerto Rico to make sure the department is leaning forward and providing all the support that they need. The National Guard of Connecticut and I think of other states have been involved in transportation. The airfields are now open to military aircraft and relief flights. Do you anticipate that military aircraft can and will be used more extensively in this effort? I, I, I do, Senator. That's absolutely part of the plan, particularly, again, for uh, generators, water, food, those kind of immediate needs. Would you anticipate that the Corps of Engineers can play a role in opening some of the ports, perhaps some of the other means of transportation that could be involved? Senator, I don't know whether it be specifically the Corps of Engineers or, or some of our combat engineers, but I, but I do believe that the military is uniquely capable of helping to clear the debris and get the airfields, uh, f repair the airfields and get them up and operating. And I can assure you, whatever capabilities are required in that regard, 
whether they're resident inside the Corps of Engineers or resident in some of our other operational units, will make sure that the right capability is at the right place. And the, the Department of Defense is indeed leaning forward and prepared, ready, able, and willing to provide whatever assistance is necessary. A absolutely, Senator. These are Americans, and, and, and we're going to do everything we can to help them out. And they are Americans. They are Americans, Senator. Uh, let me ask you about uh, the recent uh, exercises conducted by Russia. I think they were called Z Zapod, uh, Zapod West with Belarus. Uh, are there any sort of uh, lessons or other intelligence that uh, we've gained that you can discuss in this forum from having observed those exercises? Uh, Senator, probably be, uh, if, if you don't mind, reluctant to discuss it in public. I, I, I was just uh, with a meeting of all 29 NATO chiefs of defense last weekend. This, as you can imagine, was one of the topics. And then I came back out through Norway uh, with my Norwegian counterpart uh, to talk more specifically about challenges on the northern flank of NATO and, and some of the th things we've seen in the exercise. But, but I can assure you, we watch very carefully uh, what the Russians have done during Operation Zophead uh, to make sure that we understand where they are in terms of capability development and what the implications are for NATO security and for U.S. security. And despite the Russian efforts to drive wedges in our NATO alliance among our allies, would you say that uh, the NATO alliance is in good health? Right now, Senator, I would, and, and I and I certainly now have probably a five-year perspective uh, from two out of my last three assignments directly involved with NATO, and I would even say in the last year, a year ago, there was a, a strong debate inside of NATO about 360-degree security and almost a uh, a different view from those nations that viewed the South and the terrorist threat. Uh, as, as being the priority in those nations that viewed Russia as being a priority. And I think over the past year with some very strong leadership, and I think the Secretary General has been a part of that, uh, I feel much better today about the cohesiveness of NATO and about the recognition that it's not either or uh, of those threats, it's both, and that nations need to make the significant contributions to prepare us for both of those challenges. So I think the overall health of NATO is actually, uh, I would assess, to be very strong. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, but I just want to say uh, I will be strongly and enthusiastically supporting you for another term. And again, my thanks for your service and, and as well to your family. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. On behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Shaheen, please. Well, thank you. I think I'm the last one, so hopefully we will be quick. General Dunford, um, thank you to you and your family for your willingness to continue to serve in this role. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of support on this committee for um, your nomination. On Friday, it was reported that the KC-46 aero refueling tanker program was hit with three Category 1 deficiencies, including one that um, was reported as possibly jeopardizing the willingness of the Air Force to accept um, the aircraft from Boeing. How concerned are you about those deficiencies, and are you worried that we won't be able to take delivery of those aircraft by the um, scheduled time of spring of 2018? Senator, what I am concerned about is uh, the delivery of the tankers and the capability that that, that, would, that would imply a capability gap. I think if you had... Uh, uh, the transportation commander here, General McDo, today, he would talk to you about tankers as being one of his more significant challenges in meeting all of our requirements. So I, I'm not familiar uh, with the details of these deficiencies, and it, it hasn't been translated into time for me at this point. But, but I think with regard to the capability itself, that is one of the more critical capabilities in a joint force, and all of our uh, plans are based on our ability to, uh, to, to meet this requirement. Um, well, absolutely, and I, I'm sure, I assume you would give us your commitment that you will follow up and find out how serious those deficiencies are and, and whether they jeopardize the scheduled time frame for delivery. I, I will, Senator. Thank you. Um, you talked about the importance of electronic warfare and of coordinating those efforts, and also there have been several um, back and forth about Russia and its hybrid capabilities and how important that is to its, the, its current capacity to engage. Um, can you talk about how the military is looking at 
our electronic um, and cyber tools and how we're working with other departments within the federal government, treasury, state, um, to <clears throat> coordinate those efforts? Right. Uh, Senator, you know, obviously primarily focused on defending the information technology of the department as well as select uh, industrial pieces that, that support the department. So that's, that's our primary focus. And then defending the nation, which includes a suite of offensive capabilities. So uh, being able to exploit in cyberspace, being able to conduct offensive operations and defensive operations are all a piece of it. But with regard to co collaboration and cooperation, the one area that Admiral Rogers and his team are very focused on is when a vulnerability is identified, the sharing and the uh, action taken to address those vulnerabilities is an important piece, and that's going to require not only, uh, as you suggest, uh, great cooperation within the government, and I think we're, we're in a pretty good place in that regard, but it's also going to require great public-private uh, cooperation as well so that when that assistance is offered, it's accepted, uh, and there's a degree of trust that uh, what we're trying to do is actually help them uh, mitigate the risk of vulnerabilities. That's probably one of the key areas of, of cooperation. And as you, as you know, Senator, you, you've paid close attention to this issue. There's always uh, a debate about what agency within our government is best capable of performing what mission. Uh, I think that dialogue will go on for many years to come, and we're always refining it, and we should be. We shouldn't be comfortable. Uh, or complacent that we have it exactly right, and that, that dialogue is ongoing, not only about the organizational construct of Cyber Command itself, but also uh, the department's role within the broader government effort. Um, I certainly agree with that. However, I do think it's important for us to have someone within the administration who is the point person on cyber activities. Is there somebody that you're aware of who's actually the person in charge of those activities? Senator, I, I can't say that there is. It doesn't mean that there isn't. I'm, I'm not aware of somebody right now in the administration who's designated. I, I, I probably uh, and incorrectly have a decidedly DOD perspective right now, but, but I'll certainly find out. Um, well, thank you. I think it says something that as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, you're not aware of who the person is who's in charge. Um, you also talked about the importance of our alliances and partnerships and how that contributes to how Russia and our other adversaries view the strength of the United States. Do you have any sense of what the reaction would be among our partners with the JCPOA if the United States were to abrogate our commitments under that treaty? Uh, Senator, I don't have any unique insights uh, into that, but I certainly know what everybody else knows from the open source. and. And I don't think there'd be unanimity of those who were part of the JICPOA uh, were we to walk away. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you for your willingness to continue to serve. Thanks, sir. Thank you. On behalf of Chairman McCain, Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Senator Reid. Um, General Dunford, again, thank you uh, for your testimony uh, here today. Uh, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, but I also want, just want to thank you for your thorough uh, answers that you always give to our questions. They're very candid, and uh, not only your willingness to answer those questions here in a formal setting, but you've always been accessible to us uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, to answer specific questions, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate that immensely. Uh, General Lefford, I know that um, the Department is concerned about uh, the geopolitical implications of mega cities, uh, including the growth of cities of over 10 million people. Uh, I spoke with Admiral Harris about this when he testified uh, earlier uh, this year. Admiral Harris testified that there are 10 mega cities uh, in the world, with eight of them in the Pacific uh, Command area of responsibilities. And uh, these locations are, are ripe to become geopolitical hotspots, given the number of people involved and some of the unique political context uh, that they uh, are, are uh, associated with them. So the ability of the services to operate in these uh, very dense uh, urban environments uh, are going to become increasingly important, uh, both in contingency and conflict, as well as humanitarian assistance. Uh, we have uh, particular concerns about Seoul, given the threats of uh, uh, that are now uh, associated with North Koreans' action, and Seoul is obviously one of those uh, mega cities that we need to be concerned about, and also raises a host of other issues when it comes to dealing with that. If you could address uh, plans uh, that we have for dealing in, in mega cities, how you plan to deal with that issue, and are there 
needs for us to invest additional training uh, and uh, not only of the soldiers and Marines, but also developing uh, tactics and procedures that we need to go forward that we should be uh, assisting you in from a congressional perspective. Yes, Senator, I could, and I, I think the core of what we're doing to prepare for that is, is found in our exercise in our experimentation program, and it also reflects in the priorities that we'd have for innovation. And, uh, and so if you, if you take a look at our exercise and experimentation program, uh, it is focused on our ability to, to deal in a, in a very complex, dense urban terrain. I think all of us have looked at the demographics. We've looked at where people will live. We've looked at where the sources of conflict will be and uh, in preparing ourselves uh, accordingly to do that. There are some unique challenges in, in megacities. Uh, command and control is one of those challenges. Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance is, is, is one of those challenges. Uh, minimizing collateral damage while delivering effective uh, fires uh, are one of those challenges, and those are all areas uh, within the department that we are that we are working on. And, and please uh, let us know if there's anything else we can do to to help you provide the resources necessary, because I think it's uh, it's obvious that's going to be an area that we're going to have to be dealing with uh, in the future, without question. Thanks, sir. When when you uh, were asked a previous question about things not to assume in a future war, at the top of the list was our ability to dominate in space. Uh, and so I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, and in particular what we're seeing uh, uh, with the Chinese uh, that seem to be developing, uh, at least evidence suggests that they're developing as many as three different ASAT capabilities and have conducted multiple tests in space of uh, direct ascent ASAT uh, systems. They also established a, a new service a few years ago to, uh, to make that uh, capability even more robust. Uh, you could address uh, how concerned we should be, and from a congressional perspective, do we need to be putting more resources into this critical area? Senator, thanks. When we fielded the current space capabilities, we didn't field them with resilience to the current threat in mind. And so they are vulnerable to the threats that you spoke about, and uh, not only the Chinese, but the Russians and others recognize that even North Korea uh, has a nascent anti-space uh, uh, program that's there. And if you look at our dependencies in space, whether it's the timing of our systems, global prepositioning, our command and control systems militarily, or the dependence on our economy on space capabilities, the vulnerabilities in space, which we really identify in the budget as, an, as a need for increased resilience in space to those threats, the vulnerabilities have significant implications, not only from a military perspective, but from a commercial uh, perspective as well. So uh, certainly uh, part, of the, part of our budget is designed to enhance our resilience in space and also enhance the redundancies and the access that we have to a wide range of space capabilities so that we minimize the threat uh, that, that, you've, that you've identified. Um, as a result of, of that analysis and recognition, uh, probably the last three years, you have seen increased requests from the department for space-related capabilities. Again, uh, my priority at this point would be on space resilience, but there's a wide range of other capabilities we need as well. And, uh, and that, again, is informed by, uh, by the developing threat, uh, military threat, to space capabilities that we have. And, and, and uh, if I may add, uh, the point that you made, it's not just our, our military satellites. Uh, we need to be working with some of our commercial suppliers of communication satellites and other space technologies. Uh, we should uh, be stepping up our activities working with the commercial sector, I would assume? Absolutely, Senator. In fact, one of the, one of the areas that, that we believe there's some potential is to, is to better leverage commercial activities, for example, to expand our intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capability. Great. Thank you, General. Appreciate it. Uh, General, thank you for your service, selfless service, the Marine Corps and to the nation, and thank your family for their service alongside you. And on behalf of Chairman McCain, I would uh, declare the hearing adjourned. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Senator.